Welcome back to the movie recap. Today's movie will be a 2002 American war drama film titled Hearts War. So sit back, relax and enjoy the video. The movie began in winter in Belgium on December 16, 1944. The soldiers casually work at the headquarters Battalion 5 Corps, including Lieutenant Thomas Hart. A colonel approaches Hart to ask if he can drive the captain back to the 106th, to which he agrees. However, as they make their way to the snowy trails, two military police stop them and start questioning them. Not knowing they are Germans in disguise and American military police uniforms, Hart says they are headed to St. Vith. The military police insist that they are going in the wrong direction, but Hart is sure they are going the right way. The captain in the passenger seat notices movements in the bushes. He slowly pulls out his gun when the military police beside him suddenly shoots him in the head. Hart is shocked by the sudden death of the captain and the military police, revealing themselves as Germans by speaking in their language. They check the back of Hart's vehicle, where he sees the opportunity to escape. The other German soldiers in camouflage immediately stop him and rain him with bullets, leading to his struggle to escape. As he quickly runs away from death, he suddenly hits a tree and falls off on a pile of dead bodies. After attempting to escape, the Germans still hold Hart captive. He is put in a prison that is said to be impossible to run due to its farness from the train and the thickness of the snow. A warden interrogates him, making him spill out where the fuel dumps are. Hart is one of the POWs to be transported to Augsburg, Germany. Prisoners like him are squeezed at the train like cargo. Seeing him, Lieutenant Jerry offers Hart a coat to battle the cold. But, unfortunately, the cold is too challenging to handle. After some time, they reach a station where P-51 attacks them. The POW sign on the top of their trains is covered in snow, which leads to them being mistaken for Germans. Jerry escapes through a small opening on the train with a broken arm because of his fall and successfully opens the train. Unfortunately, he is unable to survive the bullets. The POWs exit the train, and the captain assembles them to spell POW with their bodies to identify them. With his brilliant idea, the military plane stops shooting at them after reading the message. However, when the aircraft cease fire, the German soldiers commanded them to fall in line and march to their new prison for days. As the POWs reach their new prison, they are reminded by the German lieutenant not to escape. As a show, they let them watch a Russian, who attempted to escape, die through strangulation. An American POW named Colonel William McNamara salutes the three dead men, and his subordinates follow him. Oberst Werner Visser, a German colonel, notices him and calls them dogs while laughing at them. Situated at Barracks 22, McNamara debriefs Hart about who interrogated him, and Hart answers that it was Lutz. During that conversation, he has flashbacks of what he answered during the investigation. He only says to McNamara that he is asked about his name, position, and serial number but lies about divulging the fuel dump's location. Then, he is assigned to Barracks 27, where enlisted soldiers are positioned. At first, he isn't entertained by the soldiers as he enters the barracks. Still, Staff Sergeant Vic Bedford immediately salutes him when he tells them his name and position. Every night, the barracks are closed from the outside so no one can escape. So as Hart goes to the bathroom, Bedford follows him and goes to one of the toilets to get out of the barracks to give him a pair of winter boots the following day. Later that day at the theater, McNamara joins Hart and tells him to let two lieutenants be based in his barracks. They are named 2nd Lieutenants Lamar Archer and Lincoln Scott. As he returns to the barracks with the two soldiers of color, confusion and disgust are visible on their faces. One soldier asks why it has to be in their place that these two men have to stay. Angry at their response, he demands them to salute the two lieutenants as high-ranking officers and show respect. With hesitation, Bedford obeys, and the rest of the men follow. However, another complaint states that the place is too crowded for them, so he says that McNamara reassigns Crouch and Krasner to Barracks 28. Bedford then expresses racist remarks about the two men of color. That night, he sees Bedford planning something under Archer's bed, but he chooses to ignore what he witnessed and pretends to sleep. The following day, the men are playing ball when a cargo of bread passes by, and Bedford throws it on the other side of the wired fence for the other prisoners. Colonel Visser witnesses the commotion and orders his soldier to fire at him, leading to him being hit on the hand on the second try. Later, he approaches Bedford asking about his hand, and eventually speaks his true intention. It is brought up to him by Major Clary that Bedford complains about the two colored men who are sharing a room with him. Bedford says he experiences colored men acting like their neighbors when they are not. He asks Hart about what he was doing before the war, revealing that he was a second-year law student at Yale. Hart tries to defend the lieutenants, but Bedford reprimands him about the military boots he gave to him. He claims it is not for free and wants his watch, which he inherited from his father, in exchange. Hart gives up his watch in hopes of Bedford gaining dignity. In the evening, 
When the soldiers are about to sleep, the Germans enter barracks 27 and shout for them to wake up. They question who the officer in charge of the place is, then Hart presents himself. They announce that someone removed a spike from one of the billet tents and remind them that weapons are not allowed. Hart vouches for his comrades that no one left that night, but the German superintendents continue to search the beds and find a spike under Archer's bed. He refuses that it was him and rigidly claims that it was planted. He is not allowed a fair trial and is immediately executed that night. McNamara disagrees with Visser's methods of discipline and punishment and signifies that these men must not be treated as dogs or a lesser race. So then, Visser's men inspect barracks 22, where the officers are located, and confiscate and destroy the radio part hidden in the walls. The day after that incident, they are casually sitting and watching in the theater. Suddenly, the sounds of P-51 bomber escorts interrupt McNamara and Hart's conversation about Scott's condition. Everyone stops and quickly goes outside to look at the military planes. The men cheer for the aircraft created by Americans. Then, suddenly, one P-51 bomber escort is shot down and crashes into the theater. Some soldiers quickly assist the pilot of the crashed plane while others extinguish the fire. Later that same night, Hart notices that Scott is nowhere to be found. Realizing this, he quickly gets up and eventually finds him outside the window attempting to exit through the bathroom toilet. However, the German commandos see him first, so they enter the room and instruct everyone to go out. As they line up outside, they identify Bedford's dead body, and Scott is accused of the murder. Still, McNamara insists that he deserves a fair trial before being convicted. Visser, after some realizations, grants them their American ways of dealing with the crime through a court-martial. He gives them a deadline until the end of the week to commence and conclude the trial, and then, the theater will be under Visser's supervision. He directs his men to bring Bedford's body to the morgue, but Hart stops them as it must now be treated as a crime scene, and photographs must be taken first. McNamara also assigns him to be the counsel to vindicate Scott. On the first day of trial, the witness on the stand is Major Fussell. He says in his testimony that he saw Scott at around 1 a.m. lying near Bedford, who seemed to be checking if the man was dead. Next, one of the corporals starts to refer to the death threats given by Scott to Bedford because he framed Archer. Next, the two first soldiers leave racist remarks because of Scott's color. Lastly, Webb is called up on trial as an eyewitness. Knowing this, Hart firmly declares that he is committing perjury because he was standing in front of Webb on the same night of the clamor and saw nothing of a scene of Scott breaking the neck of Bedford. After the trial, Hart confronts Webb because of his lies. Then, he visits Scott in his cell and apologizes for what happened. Next, he catches him writing a letter for his father, and they practice their testimony for tomorrow's trial. Afterward, he stops by Visser's abode, where Visser welcomes and rewards him with an American manual about a court-martial. The following day, Hart utilizes the manual during the trial, citing chapters and sections written to Pope McNamara into giving his testimony. He denies Hart's requests and claims it's too late for them. He then feels like he is being cornered and embarrassed by Hart and calls for a recess. As they exit the theater, McNamara suddenly gives him a scolding and threatens not to receive anything from Visser again. On the third trial, Hart stands up for Scott by referencing the photographs. In Defense Exhibit 1, Bedford's hands and cheeks are covered in soot, claiming that whoever murdered Bedford is white. He even demonstrates how Bedford is possibly killed, through strangulation. Because he struggled to survive, Bedford used his hands to defend himself, touching the painted face of the killer. He argues that Scott will not make his face any blacker, so the killer is a white man who painted themselves with soot to avoid being detected by the guards. However, the prosecutor, Captain Sisk, contradicts the statement by asking where Scott escaped. He answers that he went through the toilet, where there is possibly soot, according to the prosecutor. On the fourth trial, Hart summons Visser as the last witness. He interrogates his relationship with Bedford but says his subordinates know him more. He inquires about the possible trading that Bedford made with the warden's words and fussel in exchange for information and stuff. It seems to Visser that he is implying that his guards are the ones who murdered Archer. However, he says that if they wish to do so, they don't need to cover their faces with soot, unlike what he said in his argument on the third trial. On that evening, Hart watches one of the soldiers leave the barracks. He follows the man and escapes through the bathroom while hiding from the patrolling German soldiers. He perceives the man is making his way to the theater. He silently enters and hides from the two men leaving the place. He infiltrates the back room of the theater. He encounters Webb sealing something on the floor, so he immediately orders him to move. He removes the barricade and uncovers the wooden floor, unraveling a tunnel there. He goes down and is surprised to discover two more soldiers, German uniforms, and explosives. The situation is then explained to him that the trial is nothing but a distraction for the 35 officers to break through the tunnel tomorrow afternoon. 
The tunnel leads to the northern part of the prison, where they plan to bomb it. He realizes that McNamara will answer the questions he has. He then confronts the colonel in his barrack that night and confesses that he knew about the tunnel. McNamara says that he killed Bedford because he sold out the plans of his comrades to the Germans, just like how they were informed about the hidden radio part. He adds that he has to make sacrifices so that more soldiers will escape and survive. Hart then argues that he is the one who must sacrifice himself and not Scott. The following day, McNamara acts as if he is food poisoned. Still, they continue the last day of prosecution. He shows that he is not feeling well and has difficulty standing up. He falls to his knees, and the soldiers assist him out of the trial room to rest. Hart knows it was all a performance to make their escape plan successful, so he invites Scott to talk privately to disclose the colonel's objectives. Scott is confused and upset at the same time, making him feel like it was all a game despite two soldiers being dead. He accepts his fate and is willing to sacrifice as long as Hart tells his son the truth of what really happened at that time. In the afternoon, the closing statements of the prosecutor and opposition begin. At the same time, the 35 men are preparing to escape. The prosecutor emphasizes that Scott is a soldier and a guilty murderer. In contrast, Hart reiterates that Scott serves his country and is not a coward like Bedford. Surprisingly, he takes the blame for killing Bedford at the end of his speech, to which Visser reacts and commands to execute him without trial. The trial concludes with Hart being the murderer, and everyone marches outside to watch him be punished. The German soldiers count the lines and notice that 35 soldiers are missing, including McNamara. Because of this, Visser orders them to search the barracks and theater. Then, realizing that the pals escaped, he furiously instructs all the men who participated in the court-martial to be gunned down. Hearing this, Hart immediately shouts that they know nothing and should spare their innocent lives. After some time, they watch McNamara entering the prison area in a German uniform. As he faces Visser, the factory north of the prison explodes. He states that he grasps responsibility, and Visser must spare the other pal's life in exchange for his only. After one final salute to Hart, he is shot by Visser, and the other soldiers salute his dead body. The movie ends with Hart narrating that Colonel McNamara is buried in a marked grave behind the camp. Three months later, the Germans surrender, and their Stalock is liberated. The war is finally over, and they all return home to America. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more videos like this to help the channel out. Have a nice day.